there's so much feedback. I'm on Twitter, <laughs> microphone. Um, so the title of this talk is Leadership Networks and Multi-Team Innovation. This is work with Dorothy Carter and Steve Zuccaro, though I also want to acknowledge uh, co-op contributors, Nishir Contractor and Toshio Masse, and Raquel, who's the visual analytics um, guru. Um, so we're going to be talking about multi-team systems. And the idea here, which is not to be confused with multi-team membership and overlapping membership that's come up a number of times today, is that oftentimes we form teams to tackle tasks that are complex, um, that require uh, expertise that would be beyond what an individual can bring to the table. Just as, you know, Brian talked about this um, burden where knowledge, the knowledge frontier is expanding, those same forces that require us to use teams to be innovative are requiring us to use multi-team systems to be innovative. So a multi-team system formally defined is a goal-directed collective that is larger than a team. It's comprised of multiple teams pursuing their proximal team goals, but also partnering with other teams to accomplish larger distal goals. And so we can think about lots of different tasks and settings where multi-team systems are used, disaster response, uh, military engagements, I'm going to kind of bound this talk to say that those types of multi-team systems require <coughs> a lot of coordination, they've been studied a lot, and they're not our focus. And so our focus is really another kind of multi-team system where the goal is innovation and the goal is creativity. Oftentimes these are multi-team systems where you've got either cross-functional expertise across teams, as would be the case in new product development, or you've got interdisciplinarity, which is often the case in scientific multi-team systems. And so these are the ones we want to understand. And when we think about these multi-team systems that occur in science, we can think of examples like the Human Genome Project, which funded uh, upwards of 200 PIs in any given year and was this enormous success, despite the large numbers of individuals that were involved in the collaboration. Um, it sort of violates all of our thinking about build small, cohesive teams. On the other hand, if you're someone like Jonathan Cummings, you can tell us about all the human genome projects that we don't know the names of because they ate up tons of money and never really produced much um, in the way of scientific discovery or commercialization. And so we want to understand what distinguishes the collectives, the multi-team systems that produce these grand innovations from the ones that sort of fizzle and die of diffusion of responsibility. Um, and so with that as our backdrop, we squarely focus on leadership. And so in collectives, Leadership is the basic um, mechanism through which individuals are directed, understand how to contribute to a group, are energized and inspired to want to be a part of the group, and by group here I'm meaning um, larger collective. And so when we look at scientific, creative, innovative, multi-team systems, there are a number of unique features of leadership. For starters, Leadership is not a formal enterprise, right? In the military, leadership is a very formal enterprise. There are people, leadership means people who do it, right? And there's a clear hierarchy of how they relate to each other. In self-organizing systems, leadership is a property of the group itself. And so we can leverage this paradigm of shared or collective leadership, which argues that leadership is manifest in a pattern of influence, where the members of a group interact with each other relationally, and the purpose of those interactions is the leadership, direction setting, motivation, engagement of the collective um, in meeting its goals. And so this is sort of our view. The two questions that we ask about leadership are, first of all, what are the organizing principles through which groups form leadership structures? So where do these come from? What are the rules people are following um, when they work in these collectives? How do they organize and decide um, who's going to be leading the collective. The second question we ask is, besides universal rules that we can find in how social groups organize and set up their leadership structures, do some structures produce a sort of fitness with the innovation task that allow them to be disproportionately successful? Right? Whereas other leadership structures that groups might follow would um, result in their fate being far less um, positive. And so, First, I'll define what we mean by a leadership network. So a leadership network captures the patterns of influence that manifest within a group. These are informal. Um, they grow out of people's relationships with each other. 
Importantly, these ties that are depicted here are psychological relationships where somebody is a follower to somebody else. So these aren't friendship ties, they're not communication ties. Um, and it's important that when we think about the effects of leadership networks, we think about what's in those ties, right? So these are essentially um, follower links. These are tie from person A to person B means that individual A has formed a psychologically meaningful leadership relationship with person B, where they would say they're relying on that person, they're taking direction and inspiration from that person as they work as part of that multi-team system. And so in our study, we investigate the emergent informal leadership networks in a sample of 49 multi-team systems that are pictured here. And we're going to come back to this picture in a little bit. But first, we have two questions that we want to answer. So if you look at this side, the first question we want to know is, what are the self-organizing principles? So how do these networks emerge and come about? Are there predictable rules that people are following in not just structuring their communication networks, but they're following and structuring the influence of where ideas are going through? The second question that we ask is, OK, given some underlying social order, where we would expect some natural variability in some multi-team systems exhibit trend towards this structure versus that, what are the affordances that come from different aspects of those structures that enable some multi-team systems to be innovative and others not? And so we have a series of hypotheses. First, I'll talk about in group preference. So there's abundant theory that would support a basic rule of social order and structuring leadership relationships as basically an in-group preference rule. So in deciding to be a follower of someone, if they are a member of my in-group, in this case an in-group is a functional specialization or an interdisciplinary um, field of study, that individuals will be more likely to follow to form leadership reliance links with people who are in the same in-group, right? But conversely, there's also another literature that says they would do this and they would do it to their own demise, right? That the kind of influence that gets groups to be able to be creative and to integrate the ideas that come from different disciplines requires bridging ties, right? It requires not just communication or friendship across groups, but it requires actual influence, meaningful influence where people with one set of viewpoints are saying, you know what, in working towards this multi-team system goal, I am really relying on and I am led by, inspired by ideas that are coming out of other groups, right? So we think groups in general, the social rule they're going to follow is this, in group preference, but the social rule they should follow that enables and affords innovation is a prevalence of bridging ties. The second self-organizing principle we look at is hierarchy versus heterarchy. So we could think of this as just centralization, right? So there's some evidence that would suggest um, that, you know, if we look at research on advice ties, they tend to be kind of um, not mutual, right? And you tend to get structures where, um, where there might be hubs, right? Of people that sort of draw in, once you draw in one person as an advice tie, other people see that and say, oh, that might, must be, person must have some good advice, so I'm gonna go to that person. Um, so we investigate this presence of hub. In terms of what it affords for innovation, we predict that they're not, forming hubs is not good for innovation and leadership early on, but it is good later on, right? At some point, um, innovation requires both the generation of novel ideas, but also the implementation or the realization of those ideas, which <coughs> requires integration and order. Um, the third principle we look at is something we call status preservation, right? And so, Groups maintain um, a sort of perception of social status. People can identify what their status is, what other people's status are. Um, and one of the interesting things with leadership ties is that when somebody relies on you for leadership, it would be sort of unlikely, it would be counterintuitive or be counterproductive for status preservation for you to in turn follow them, right? So we think that the general rule, rule that we'll see is that groups, people in groups will engage in status preservation when they're forming leadership networks. We also propose that they'll do this to their own demise, and that the extent to which they form, not they don't preserve status, but rather they form reciprocated or mutual leadership relationships, that that will enable innovation, right? This is that classic act of collective leadership where it's easy for someone to step up, 
but can they also step down, right? And so we all know the story of Julius Caesar, right? So Rome had this great mechanism in place. In a, they had this beautiful republic that was very flat, but then as soon as a crisis happened, they would appoint a dictator, and Julius decided he didn't want to step down, right? So we know that there's this difficulty, um, but we think it's important for innovation. <laughs> that people can both lead and follow in the same relationship. And so we tested the, these ideas using two student samples. Um, so we took students taking classes in the sciences. They were taking a class either in a, environmental ecology, or they were taking a class in social psychology, or they were taking a class in innovation and entrepreneurship. And we had them work on an environmental problem space where there was a need for ecology students to diagnose a natural resource that's being depleted by human behaviors, but they don't know how to change behaviors, and they certainly don't know how to commercialize a product that would, that's use of that product would systematically result in the change of behavior on a mass scale. So that's why we brought in social psychologists who know how to change targeted behaviors. Um, and the social psychologists know how to change behaviors, but they don't necessarily think about exactly how to commercialize a product that when people buy and use this product, such as a smartphone app, it would regulate their behavior and produce some change at a mass scale that would improve environmental sustainability. So these students were taking a course. They were at one university. They were in a class of people all studying the same discipline. And they formed a project team. And they had to do a project that required them to apply their disciplinary knowledge. But then we partnered up these project teams within disciplines across universities and disciplines so that they had this grand goal that was also part of their course requirements of improving environmental sustainability, for which they were now part of a multi-team system where you had three or four teams who worked together throughout the course of the semester, pursuing both proximal team goals and also global multi-team system goals. We then, uh, they went through these two kind of exploration exploitation phases. So we had different deliverables along the way. <coughs> the midpoint was very meaningful. This is where they kind of had to converge on an idea. And then they had to implement and integrate. So they had to have clearly specified links between the ecological problem, the social psychological solution, and how a product was going to implement that knowledge, basic science, into something usable. The analytic strategy that we used um, was a combination of methods. First, um, slide, we use exponential random graph models where we can predict, again, we're trying to predict the emergence of leadership networks. So we can enter structural signatures that correspond to our predicted mechanisms of social order. Um, the second thing that we did was to ask the question of does, so the first question is really an assembly question, right? It's how do leadership networks come about? Right, in general. But the second question is, how, what are the consequences of how they come about? Right? So if the group follows rules A, they're not very innovative. But if they follow rule set B, they're much more innovative. So to do that, we split the multi-team systems based on the ones that were very innovative, moderately innovative, and not at all innovative. And we re-ran these ergam analyses to identify these social rules in these different sub-samples. And then third, we use traditional regression at the multi-team system level of analysis where we regress innovation on um, these network metrics. So in terms of leadership networks, we measured them twice. First at the midpoint of the project um, and second at the end point of the project. This was a uh, perceptual social network measure where we asked everyone the prompt um, that Carson developed in a 2007 AMJ paper, who do you rely on for leadership? Um, and then we represented the structure using some sort of standard network metrics, which I'll explain. And so this, this is our home movie um, of what our leadership networks look like. This is the midpoint. Um, these are separate MTSs that are kind of grouped near each other. You can see some ties just went away, the midpoint just happened. Nodes are people. Directed ties means that A relies on B for leadership. If there's arrows both ways, it means this is mutual, <coughs> reciprocated leadership influence. I think now you see the ending network. Um, and the color coding is the teams, right? So if the nodes are the same color, they're the same team. We've also color coded, I don't think you can see this, the edges, right? And so 
If it's red, it's a between team tie, right? Which means that these individuals have not engaged in in group preference. They've actually formed a relationship with a leadership relationship with someone who's on another team or has different functional expertise. And so now we're interested in looking at these structures to say, can we explain the order of how these leadership networks came about by looking at these three underlying rules? And so what I'll present here, the bars um, are time one and time two networks. They're not, we're not making specific hypotheses here about the differences between them. We're just showing that the pattern is robust, that the organizing principle is explaining in a similar way the emergence of the network at multiple time points. And we'll note some differences. So first, if we look at in-group preference, we see strong evidence of this. Um, we can see that nearly, you're nearly five times as likely to follow someone in your functional team than you are to follow someone who's in another functional team. So those, tie, those leadership ties are very unlikely to form. <coughs> Next, we looked at hierarchy, and we see that actually, um, I call this hierarchy because we don't see evidence of it. So this is the idea of hubs. This parameter was negative and significant, which means that you're likely to have one follower, but as soon as you have one follower, other nodes don't follow you, right? Which kind of makes sense um, since it's not a coordination task, it's a thinking task, right? And so, um, so we'll talk more about that. And we didn't see evidence here of status preservation in the full sample. Um, now we split the groups. Oh, and we, yeah, we didn't see the status preservation. Okay, so now we split the groups into the low, medium, and high performing multi team systems, and we see something very, very interesting. So remember, this is the full sample. You're five times as likely to form a leadership reliance relation to follow somebody who's on your team than on another team. But notice that the top performing multi team systems don't follow this rule, right? Their odds ratios, in fact, are not significantly different from one, which means. In the top performing NTSs, you are just as likely to form a leadership or follower relationship with someone who's in another team as you are to form that relationship with someone in your team. So bottom performers engage in this in-group preference in forming their leadership relationships. Moderates do it. They back off a little bit at the end point, but the top performers don't do it. They don't do it at the beginning, and they don't do it later on. Now we look at the same effect. Um, now we're looking at hierarchy and network formation, and we'll notice one interesting pattern. The hierarchy, the hub, we we'll call it hub suppression. This effect where as soon as you have one tie, no one else will follow you, that we see with leadership, that goes away. It does. People don't start forming hubs, but the suppression of hubs goes away only in the top performers only. Rate. And I'll come back to that. And then the last one, we look at status preservation, and we see in the bottom MTSs. They are zero times as likely to follow or follower than a non-follower. These groups are preserving a status hierarchy, right? So if somebody follows you, you don't follow them back. But look at what's happening in the top performers. In the top MTSs, individuals are more than two times as likely to follow their follower than to follow a non-follower, right? So if we think about this in terms of this is a mutuality parameter, so the top performing MTSs are using mutuality as a rule in forming leadership relationships, whereas the bottom performers are not. Um, we also tested these same effects using regression analysis at the MTS level. And so here we put in bridging ties, which is the number, you know, controlling for the number of within team leadership links, how many leadership links are in the MTS that are connecting one members, uh, members of one team with members of another team. That explains 21% of the variance after the covariance in final innovation. We also looked at centralization. Notice centralization doesn't matter to innovation at time one, but it does at time two. So you explain an additional 5% of <coughs> innovation by looking at how centralized the leadership network is at the later time point. And the third one is mutuality. So leadership ties don't tend to be reciprocated but if they are, that's a good thing for innovation, right? So in conclusion, we'll make it on time. Um, leadership networks exhibit some predictability, right? So they, this isn't random. Um, individuals in multi-team systems doing these creative tasks tend to follow these two rules. One is they show in-group preference on the whole. You're more likely to follow somebody who is in your in-group than to follow somebody who's not. The second is they engage in this hierarchy 
right? Which is, I'm not going to follow somebody who's got another follower, right? Maybe they're keeping the group in disagreement, they're finding supporters for their ideas as opposed to ideas that have already been endorsed. Um, people who've led departments say it's like herding cats. Maybe we're seeing this cat herding effect. Um, but importantly, we see that innovative MTSs write their own rules. And they have three organizing principles which distinguish them from moderately and uninnovative MTSs. The first one being they don't show in-group preference. Leadership relationships are equally likely to form with members of outgroups. The second is that they're not hub averse at the midpoint, right? So that when, they're, when they pass the midpoint and it's time to implement and integrate, they stop engaging in that rule of because you already have a follower, I will not follow you. And the third thing they do is they disregard <laughs> status, right? So they are just as likely to form, or they are twice as likely to, for, to start following someone who is following them, right? As opposed to kind of preserving that status. And we'll stop there for questions. Very much, Leslie. Uh, do you have some questions? Maybe I'll ask some questions. I um, do. So thanks, Leslie. That's really interesting. And I, um, I had a question about how, I mean, in your in your um, multi-team systems, they um, you didn't have a formal hierarchy at all, right? Right. So, so what if there was a, f a formal hierarchy imposed on the system in some way? And, and you know, I guess this is a thought experiment. I mean, what do you think you would find? And in terms of the top performing, the most innovative MTSs, what, what would you expect? Um, I would probably expect that they would break that hierarchy, right? So I think it's interesting to think about, you know, we saw these results. By the way, we thought we would find hubs, right? I mean, we've done lots of this coordination, and we work with the military, and um, we expected to see centralization in leadership. And so you really can't divorce these findings from the fact that it is a creative task and the fact that people have very different viewpoints, right? So if you're developing, half of these guys were working on developing apps to improve environmental sustainability. And the views of the business teams and the views of the ecology team could not have been, looking at Steve Zaccaro, who's teaching a lot of those social psych students, um, you know, these guys did not agree. And so a lot of the leadership network served this function of destabilization, right, and not letting in other groups. Um, you'll see cases where um, the business team that was doing the commercialization, different, so in ecology, one ecology person is following one person in business, and the other, their teammate, is following someone else, right? It's like that person wasn't receptive to my idea as a business, so I'm going to go through that person. We can all think of cases where that happens, right, in scientific systems. There are people with high degrees of expertise, lots of autonomy, we get to pick what we work on. Um, you know, it's a different, I, I think that when you impose a hierarchy on that, it sort of has to break down for innovation. Um, I, <laughs> a couple of responses, response to that. We actually did try this, um, and we have some data, but here's the thing. These are very different functional teams. It's very difficult to have a, a leadership structure imposed on them that generates the, the um, uh, capital to do both process facilitation and then knowledge exchange facilitation. So we did it with process facilitation. All of these ties that happen, as I witnessed from one of the instructors as well as a researcher, is that they're functionally related, is that someone from the the business team or the ecology team, the social psychology team, is able to bridge and help these uh, people come together in terms of their knowledge integration and knowledge collaboration. The, you can't get a leadership team to be able to do that because it would have to be multidisciplinary. But I was doing some focus group interviews for another project in which I saw multi-team systems within the same broad functional area. And they did have, or they, they, they do have an evidence of a overarching leadership team. And I think you would might find some breakdown. So it's important to think about the nature of the composition of the MTS. The more functionally diverse it is, um, the less likely I think the imposition of a top-down leadership structure is going to be. Okay. Hope that answers your question. So I, I love the uh, the follow 
a follow the follower um, <coughs> result. Follow the follower. And I'm just curious, as you observed these teams, if you did, did the top performing teams that have this follow the follower, did they feel like, did they feel different? Were they having a better time? Was it partly that that encouraged them to do that? Um, so the business teams were in France. Um, that made this oh, even, yeah, we um, and Dorothy and I were there during the final, you know, when we announced kind of who won this design competition, and we filmed little videos, so the top performing, and, you know, the debriefing of this was interesting, because you had the range of emotions from, this is the most miserable, torturous project I could, <laughs> you know, like you took team projects and made them more miserable. <laughs> to, oh my god, this is a life-changing experience. Right? And this, when we talked to the really the ones who really kind of won, they were so excited to talk with, the t you know, to get back in touch with the teams that were at George Mason and Georgia Tech. Um, but again, you had so many people in the debriefing that were on the non-innovative teams, and they just felt angry, right? Like, god, we just couldn't launch, and it's everyone else's fault but mine. Right. Um, so there was definitely emotional differences across those. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I found some similarities between the multi-team systems and the transactive memory networks um, Andrea talked about and found lots of similarities. For example, I want to get your um, sense about to what, what extent do you think the leadership networks might be a reflection of <coughs> the existence of an effective transactive memory system you know, in these multi-team systems. For example, the leadership is very much diffuse in multi-team systems because they are from different functional units, right? That's why um, when it comes to business um, operations, the ecology members might look to business you know, team for leadership and vice versa. So the following each other phenomenon might be um, a reflection of a successful transactive memory system in there, and the highly concentrated following relationship might be a reflection of failure of establishing an effective transactive memory system. I just wonder about your thoughts on that. Uh, definitely could be. We didn't measure transactive memory systems. Um, we tried to, actually. And didn't get much variability in that. They're very difficult to measure in multi-team systems to a priori extrapolate what the dimensions that are being distributed of cognition are and who's holding it. But from observing these qualitatively, it was so much more complex than that. There were times that the business students were doing ecology research, right? So, <laughs> I mean, it really wasn't as clean as, you know, these kind of clear functional areas. I wonder about the, the causality, which direction uh, does it flow, or maybe it flows both ways, and, and then whether you see mechanisms for both. Is it that innovative teams that are more disposed to innovation then adopt different organizing, organizational practices and leadership structures, or the other way around, that if you are more gravitating towards a leadership structure, the door for innovation really opens up? Interesting question. Without an experiment, we really can't kind of look at that. Right, because we didn't manipulate these structures predictably along these lines, we observed them. Um, so it's, you know, having said that, it's hard to imagine that they knew they were a highly innovative MTS, sort of before, you know, these measures were at about three or four weeks um, of interacting. So, but I, you know, there could be some elusive innovation property that they were aware of um, before the network. So that's certainly a so I'll follow up on the transactive memory question. It seemed to me that you could look within function and look at the distribution of that person, people in a function being nominated as a leader. So you gave your example, you said that they had two different leaders in the business group. So you could look at within social psychology, within business, within ecology, is there one person who's receiving a large number of the nominations? I, so what would be the idea that it would be good to have only have, one person sorry, we, doing the virgin? That when you put up your, when you put up your um, leadership network, at first I said, that's chaos. <laughs> There's, they don't agree. But then I just said, what if I overlay a function on it? 
right? And so there might be lots of structure there uh, where he's a leader in one area, I'm a leader in another area, Andrea, Andrea's a leader in a very different area. And it might look like that we're, you know, all nominating each other as leaders, but it's in, on very different uh, uh, domains. So we did try to tease apart different dimensions of leadership, <clears throat> and we actually found no ability for participants to discriminate. So one of the debates um, in shared leadership is, you know, how much can you capture by just asking this broad question? So the, asking people who do you rely on for leadership captures their implicit understanding of what that means, right? Well, but then you could say, okay, that's what matters because whether I'm going to follow or be influenced by someone does matter whether they meet my implicit standard of leadership, right? So in some way that's sort of good, but other people have said, well, there's multi, you know, leadership is multidimensional. Some people are the social coordinator, some people are the direction setter, some people serve the integration function, some people do divergent thinking, some people do convergent thinking. We assessed painfully all of those multidimensional networks and found that there was the clock correlations between every pair of networks was so high. There was essentially no, they would say yes, right? They would say, who do you rely on for leadership? Who do you rely on to give you different ideas? They say the same people. Who do you rely on to help you focus and know exactly how to contribute? They say the same people. Who energizes you? Who keeps the team socially cohesive? The same people. Um, so we would we agree with you. We would like to believe in this kind of multi-dimensional <laughs> sharing. Yeah, but you, you, you've got the data to do it. I mean, just look within the functions. You've got nominations across multiple Leadership people. functions? No, the, the main no, the social psychology, yeah, the, ecology, yeah, yeah. business. Okay. Take those as buckets and, ask, and find out from the response. Do they nominate the same people within this function? Right? Versus it just spread out. Because then no one's leading that area. Right. That's a great idea. Did you in here? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm a little unclear, so I want to talk to you afterwards about it. Because it wasn't it the case that we tended to see a vertical leadership pattern within the team, but shared neutrality between teams? Um, um, no. no. Yeah. I don't think we found that, but most of them are small teams. Yeah, that's why I have yeah, we'll to talk, we'll talk some more of it. Um, Leslie, that the animation was great. Um, Raquel. Oh, okay. <laughs> well done, Raquel. Yeah. Um, one point is you, at one stage you talked about the midpoint. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of, you know, midpoint and Connie Garcia goes sort of yeah. hand in glove. So do you want to say a little bit about how the midpoint, because I, I don't know of any work that really looks at the punctuated equilibrium model in the team setting with a network framework. So do you want to say anything about that? So one of the other interesting things I didn't say about this is that when we ran the time two ergrams, we controlled for the time one leadership networks. Um, it's significant in all of them, but it's the smallest and it's significantly different from the middle group or the top group for the innovative MTSs, meaning there was the most change, right? So essentially you're using, in addition to these kind of endogenous network predictors of self-organization, you're putting in the relational, right? So all of the, the relational patterns hold with or without controlling for prior leadership networks. But when you put prior leadership networks in, you see that in the non-innovative MTSs, the, st the structure stays stable. In the moderate, it stays stable, but a little less so. And in the highly innovative, it is the least stable meaning there's the most change in these influence relationships. And it's, that's controlling for the number of ties. So it's not just that the innovative tie, teams are forming more over time, right? They're actually changing um, where the pipes of influence are in the systems. Yeah, and that's, that is really fascinating. We're trying to nail that down, what's happening, because the <coughs> so many of you know the innovation process, some researchers have said the nature of leadership has to change from what was the midpoint to the end point. Yeah. And we actually tried to do some research around that, measuring it, and in one study um, of intervening, teaching a leadership team to do that. Um, that's the fascinating thing, that in, in, in highly innovative teams, it may be that, and this goes back to your point, I think, that leaders who are going to be more structural, structuring, meaning uh, um, um, imposing, helping the team reach its product, get its deliverable out, as opposed to brainstorming are the ones who might change. So that's the kind of thing. We, I don't know, we, we could nail it down first in the data you're reporting. And we're trying to see what we have in the others. But that's the fascinating thing about that part, in that the high innovation teams, they may actually be switching the focus of their leadership. And if there are other individuals who could do that, to your question, that's why you're seeing that shift to different leaders. Speculation. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, thank you, Leslie, for a great talk. Uh, let me echo uh, Prasad's uh, praise for the, for the animation. That's actually what I want to ask uh, a question about. Um, it, the animation clearly shows that there's a development over time. Um, and your, your ergo models basically require that you collapse the development into some kind of consolidated structure, uh, or, or several of those. Uh, have you considered uh, analyzing it as a, as a full longitudinal process? I would love to do that, Robert. So actually, the animation was the trickery and not the ergos. So the, there are only two measurements, but in order to build you know, two time points in the dynamic visual wasn't nearly as cool. So we built it up by doing you know, time one networks and then deleting the ties that went away for time two and then adding the new ties so that you see more of the progression. But in reality, the deletion <laughs> and the addition <laughs> happened at the same time. <laughs> so the truth of that. <laughs> I'm taking responsibility for it. <laughs> so we're, we're trying to get dynamics. But we very much want to do that. Um, the challenge just goes back to John Matthews' point earlier. How do you do this without surveys? Right? The, the challenge is, um, you know, we can't ask these students to fill this out every hour like we would like to, and we can see. But, but I, I guess you, you, you do have, or you could collect uh, the email interaction between them and code that for leadership-related interaction, right? Yes, yeah, Steve's lab is doing that right now. Um, and Basecamp, we, so they used WebEx, Basecamp, and email, mm -hmm. and we took all that trace data, and so, we are, in fact, doing, attempting to do that now. With, with that, you could even do re relational Relational event analysis. Yes, we'll be calling. Yeah, Robert, you have a question. Other questions?